Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on the required practicals that are going to be in Chemistry Paper 2. This video is for the AQA specification and it's for Combined Scientists and that's the trilogy version of Combined Science which means you do six papers each of which are one hour and 15 minutes long. And this video is for Foundation Tier. So for the 2022 exam they've told you to focus on the following required practicals rate of reaction and paper chromatography. So the rest of this video will outline in detail these practicals. Also have a look out in the description because I'll put a link to the content for this paper that they've asked you to focus on. And I'll also put a link in there for some questions for you to practice on these required practicals. Paper chromatography required practical. We use paper chromatography to separate coloured substances. So in this practical, you may be asked a question similar to the one above that says, do food dyes A and B contain chemicals that are in band dye X? So in this practical, we're going to separate three dyes, A, B, and another one called X, and we're going to compare the patterns at the end of the practical. In your exam, they might not talk about food dyes. They might be talking about inks or another random coloured substance, but the process is exactly the same. What you need to do to start off with is draw a horizontal pencil line around two centimetres from the bottom of a piece of chromatography paper. Do not use pen, as this will smudge and spread up the paper. Pencil is insoluble, so will not dissolve in the solvent. So this line here that we draw on must be drawn in pencil. On the pencil line put a small dot of the dies that you want to separate and label these with pencil underneath. So I've labelled them A, B and X. Place the chromatography paper in a solvent, for example water. The solvent must be below the pencil line. Put it in a beaker with a lid to prevent the solvent from evaporating. Then we leave until the solvent front nearly reaches the top of the paper, then remove the chromatography paper and leave to dry. So the process of separating a substance through chromatography has two different stages. The paper itself is called the stationary phase. And when the inks are dissolved in the solvent, that is called the mobile phase. And within the inks that you've put on the paper, you will have different compounds and they will interact differently with the paper and they will have different solubilities. So they will spend different times attached to the paper in the stationary phase and different amounts of times dissolved in the solvent in the mobile phase. So you'll end up separating the substance as it moves up the paper. And to do that, what happens is the solvent moves up the paper and when it hits the dyes, it dissolves any of the soluble compounds in the dyes. That will then, they will then be carried up the paper in the mobile phase and depending on their solubility they will stop at different distances up the paper. I mentioned earlier the solvent front, that is where the solvent finishes as it goes up the paper. So if the solvent is moving up and it gets close to the top of the paper, where it reaches here is called the solvent front and when it gets near to the top we would then remove the paper and leave it to dry. So the pattern left on the chromatography paper is called a chromatogram. So after we've left it to dry, we'll see several dots of different colours on the piece of paper. We would then compare the chromatograms of dyes A and B with the chromatogram of the band dye X. In your exam, you're likely to see a chromatogram in black and white like this, rather than it being printed in colour. And each dot just shows how one of the colours is separated as it's gone up the page. So you can see here, dye A has two dots and so has dye X. And this top dot here is in exactly the same position as the one on X, suggesting it could be the same compound. Now you'd want to investigate this further to see if dye A does contain one of the chemicals that is in the banned food dye X. Because we've only tested this so far on one solvent, we chose the solvent as water. 
But to be absolutely sure that our food dye contains a banned chemical, we would need to repeat this in different solvents, for example, maybe ethanol. And if this compound in A matched X in different solvents, it's highly likely that it is containing that banned compound. We can't just be sure if we just use one solvent. We must repeat it with different solvents to be absolutely sure. In different solvents, different compounds will spend different amounts of time in the mobile and stationary phases. And what we'll talk about later is the fact that they can have different RF values. The position of this colour on dye A does not match that of dye X. And you can see for dye B, it only has one colour here, and it doesn't match at all with dye X. Now, because dye B's got one colour and one colour only, this tells us that dye B is a pure substance, because it only contains one compound. In the exam, you might be asked to calculate an RF value. You do this by calculating the distance travelled by a substance divided by the distance travelled by the solvent. This top line here is representing the solvent front, which is where the solvent got to before we took the paper out of the beaker. And I'm just going to show you an example using one compound here that we found on our chromatogram. Now the important thing is when you're calculating the RF values, you must calculate it from the centre of the dot on your chromatography paper. Not at the top, not at the bottom, but right in the middle of the dot that you're using. And the baseline that we're using is our pencil line where the die started. So we need to measure the distance travelled by the substance, so this distance here, and then the distance travelled by the solvent. So let's say, for example, the distance travelled by the substance was 400 millimetres and the distance travelled by the solvent was 500 millimetres, then we do 400 divided by 500 to get us an RF value of 0.8. As I alluded to previously, RF value will be different depending on the solvent used. So this could be, for example, the RF value for water for this particular compound, but if the solvent was ethanol, then this number here would be different. Rates of reaction required practical. When wanting to calculate the rate of a reaction, you might need to use one of these two equations. The first one says the rate of reaction can be calculated by the amount of reactant used up over time. And the second one is the amount of product made over time. So we're going to design some investigations using these two equations. Now there are several factors that you may be asked about in the exam that affect the rate of reaction. Those include temperature, concentration and surface area. So you may well be designing experiment and changing any one of these three things. So that would be your independent variable. And if you change temperature for example, you need to keep concentration and surface area of your reactants the same. And the same goes if you are selecting a different independent variable. One of them you change and the other two you have to keep the same. There are several different practicals that you can do to calculate rate of reaction and any one of these may come up in the exam. So this first one focuses on the amount of product made over time and the independent variable that we're going to change is concentration. So we'd measure 50 ml of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid using a measuring cylinder and pour it into a conical flask. We'd place for example, one centimetre of magnesium into the conical flask, attach a gas syringe and start a timer. So in here we'd have our acid and our piece of magnesium, which you should know is going to create hydrogen gas. To calculate the rate of reaction in this experiment, we could record the volume of gas produced at regular intervals, for example, every 30 seconds for five minutes. And as gas is produced by the reaction, the gas syringe will move outwards and you can measure the volume of gas produced. Do not write amount, you must use the word volume. Then we would plot the volume of gas produced against time on a graph and we can use this to calculate the mean rate of reaction and I'll go through how we do this 
later on. We then repeat the experiment for the following concentrations of acid. So this will be our independent variable, the concentrations of acid. The dependent variable would be our volume of gas, which we then turn into our rate of reaction down here. And important control variables are things such as the volume of acid that we are using, the length of magnesium that we're using, and things such as temperature as well. As in all experiments, it's also really important to talk about the fact that you're going to repeat the experiment three times and calculate a mean for each concentration of acid that you're using. So a different practical setup now, but still looking at how concentration affects the rate of reaction. This time, this focuses on the equation, the amount of reactant used over time. So we start off by placing a conical flask on a balance and zeroing the balance. We would then measure 50 mils of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid and pour this into the conical flask. And we then place one centimetre of magnesium into the conical flask and start a timer. We take the initial reading on the balance as well. So we're starting off with a mass of 25 grams. Now again, we're using magnesium and acid, so we're producing a gas. And because we have no bung on the conical flask, that gas is going to be allowed to escape out of the conical flask. And in doing so, because mass is escaping from the system, the reading on the balance is going to go down. So to calculate the rate of reaction, we can record the mass on the balance every 30 seconds. So we'd wait 30 seconds, write down the new mass, another 30 seconds, again writing down the mass, and so on, and so on. And then we plot the mass against time on a graph, and we can calculate the mean rate of reaction. We'd repeat this experiment for the following concentrations of acid, 0.5 molar, 0.7 molar, and 1 molar. And as always is good practice, right at the end that you're going to repeat it three times for each concentration and calculate a mean. A third practical that you might see in your exam, again answering the same question, we're changing concentration and measuring the rate of reaction, is when you draw a black cross on a white tile or piece of paper and place a conical flask on top. We'd measure 50 mils of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid using a measuring cylinder and pour that into the flask. And we'd also measure 50 mils of sodium thiosulfate using a measuring cylinder and pour that in the flask as well. So you can see at the moment when we've put the acid and sodium thiosulfate in, we can still see the cross because the solution is colourless. However, gradually over time, a precipitate will form to make the solution go cloudy. And at that point, we will no longer be able to see the cross. So you can see now, when the solution has gone cloudy, we can no longer see the cross. And we then record the time it takes for the cross to completely disappear. Obviously, this is subject to error because different humans will have a different opinion on the exact time that the cross has disappeared. We'd repeat the experiment for the following concentrations of acid, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 and 1 molar. And for this one, because we're not measuring the amount of reactant used or the amount of product made over time, we're simply looking for the time it takes for a colour change. We could use the equation rate equals 1000 divided by time to calculate a rate of reaction for each concentration that we're using. So with the results of a rate of reaction experiment, you may well be asked to draw a graph or do some calculations using a graph that's provided to you. So let's look at this graph here first of all. This might be a graph that we might have drawn from the first experiment whereby we we're measuring the volume of gas produced over time. A few things about rate of reaction graphs to start off with then. The steeper the gradient, the faster the rate of reaction. So you can see this first section here is really steep. Then a shallower gradient here, so the rate of reaction is slowing down. And at this point here, where the graph starts to level out, the reaction has actually stopped. And we know that because if you read off the graph here, no more gas is being produced. So here are some common questions that you're asked. One here says, what is the mean rate of reaction? 
So to calculate this from the graph, you would find out the point where the reaction stopped, draw a line from the x-axis up to that point, and then a line across to the y-axis, and you would read off from the bottom the time that it took, so 15 seconds, because from 0 to here is 15 seconds, and the volume of gas produced in that time, from the 0 up to here, so 34 approximately, and then we would calculate that by doing 34 divided by 15, giving us an answer of 2.3 centimetres cubed per second. We always do the y divided by the x in our calculations, and we get the units for rate by reading them off the graph. Centimetres cubed divided by seconds is what we've done, so those are our units. They could also ask for a mean rate of reaction for a particular time point. For example, what is the mean rate of reaction between 4 and 12 seconds? And in that case, at time point 4, you draw a dotted line up and across to the y-axis. You do the same for 12, and then you would read off between those two sections. So between 4 and 12, we've got a time of 8 seconds. And between our two markers on the y-axis here, we have a volume of gas produced of 12.5 centimetres cubed. So to calculate the rate of reaction, again, we do the y divided by the x. So our y value is our 12.5 divided by our x value of 8 seconds. 12.5 divided by 8 gives us, for that section of the graph, a mean rate of reaction of 1.6 centimetres cubed per second.